So we'll continue with lipids. Um, we are saying that fats are nonpolar, so they will not dissolve in water. But also, when you talk about fats, um, we say they form an emulsion. These small droplets or these uh, globules that uh, of fat that breaks down emulsifiers will break down the globules of fat into smaller droplets so if you want to emulsify something like like what you do um what you do with, with uh cooking oil you say all right let me put soap in cooking oil so that it breaks down so that is emulsification so emulsification is the breaking down of uh, like fat substances in in water so wh what does wh wh what what um, happens with fat to do emulsification you need to understand one thing fat has this side that is C O O H. This part and then has this side that is all this H H H H what all all this H H. This part is non polar end. This part is a polar end. So uh, this polar end will interact with water. This polar end is hydrophilic. So hydrophilic is also called water loving. So hydrophilic uh, is water loving. So this part will dissolve in water. While this, this nonpolar end is hydrophobic. Hydrophobic means water hating. That's, that's how soap the soap works soap is also a fatty acid so fatty acids have nonpolar end which attaches to the fat i mean emulsifiers that is like soap that's how soap ends emulsifiers have nonpolar end which attaches to the fat and a polar end which interacts with water molecules so that they are able to uh the soap or the emulsifier will attach to this side will attach to this side so that the fat itself can interact with water and the other part of the soap will attach to this side to to get the uh, the fat uh, to disperse the fat molecules so the process itself is emulsification so emulsification is breaking down uh, globules or globules ah what is this doing So breaking down uh, globules of fat into smaller droplets. So globules of fat 
into smaller droplets. So how do they do that? Uh, emulsifiers have nonipolar end. This nonipolar end interact with the nonipolar end of fat here. So this nonipolar end will attach to the nonipolar end of the fat. And they also have the polar end. The polar end will attach to the polar side of the fat. Although fat is nonipolar, but it has a, a polar side. So uh, the, the emulsifiers will attach themselves to also the polar side. It may, when uh, the emulsifier attaches to this side, it makes it makes it possible to break down the fat molecules into smaller particles in water, and that is emulsification. Then we have um, two types of fats that we are going to talk about. These are saturated fats versus unsaturated fats. I think I already said, as I already said at the beginning, uh, the saturated fats have no double bonds. So that's how we define uh, saturated fats. No double bonds. So they have single bonds everywhere. And you will see what it means. And uh, we already looked at, the, uh, at them uh, when we are talking about uh, margarine being a solid and cooking oil being a liquid. So they tend to be solid at room temperature. Usually saturated fats will come from animals. That's why they are solid. Then we have unsaturated fats. So unsaturated fats have at least one double bond. So what does it mean? Saturated fats cannot add more hydrogen. So cannot add more hydrogen. Reason because all the chemical bonds are full. We don't have any double bonds. Unsaturated fats have at least one double bond. Therefore, they can add more hydrogen to fill up that bond. They can add more hydrogen. So polyunsaturated, um, polyunsaturated fats have multiple double bonds, which means they can even add more hydrogens. And they will be more liquid at room temperature. Like the ones we saw uh, in the other video. So th those are fats. Then we go to another set of lipids. In terms of lipids, what we have been talking about is only fats, fats, fats. But we go to another set of lipids, what we call phospholipids. Phospholipids have a phosphorus in them. Have a phosphorus in their back Bone. So they have a phosphorus in their backbone. And uh, because of that, um, they have this, what do we call a phosphorus, but it is given as a phosphate. Because they have a, a phosphate, phospholipids are polar. Phospholipids are polar. So take note. Fats themselves, most of them are nonpolar. But only phospholipids are polar because they have a phosphate. That gives them polarity. So if, if I ask you, why are phospholipids polar? The answer is, they are polar because they have a phosphate that gives them polarity. 
and because of that they are hydrophilic that is water loving so they have a hydrophilic head a head that is water loving and they have a hydrophobic tail a tail that is water hating so one part of it, of them will love water and one part of them will hate water and they are important parts of a cell membrane cell membrane of a cell uh, part of it is made of uh, phospholipids so phospholipids are, and I'll show you the diagram of a phospholipid this is another lipid a third lipid is known as steroid so uh, these ones are skeletons of four carbon rings and we'll see the diagrams of this cholesterol is part of steroid so when you say oh i don't you know i don't like cholesterol that is steroid so a, a cholesterol is a steroid which functions in a membrane structure and hormone synthesis so if 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 you are if someone asks you which fat is responsible for hormone synthesis the answer will be cholesterol so take note of that cholesterol is responsible for hormone synthesis but it is also responsible in membrane membrane structure so also cholesterol herbs in membrane structure so take note of that it does these two things So uh, uh, we we'll talk, we'll talk about um, these two types of fats. Um, I mean, phospholipids, uh, steroids, different types of uh, lipids. So this one is a phospholipid. You can see we have a fatty acid chain here, and here we have a phosphate with all this. That's why it is called a phospholipid. You can be shown a diagram, where, and then the question will be, which lipid is this? Then you say this is a phospho. Oh, this is a phospho lipid because it has a phosphate it has a phosphate this part is a phosphate group so take note of that and this part is a polar it's a polar head this part is a non polar tail of a phospholipid and uh, because of that uh, phospholipid um, is used in cell membrane so if, so if someone asks which lipid is usually used in cell membrane the answer is yeah it is uh, phospholipid so if someone asks which lipid is used in cell membrane the answer is it is phospholipid you can see that these ones are the hydrophilic heads inside here hydrophobic 
tails. That's how cell membrane is. So outside, it needs to react with fluids outside. Inside, it needs to be water heating. Then we have also um, another categorization of fats. We have saturated fats, cis fat, trans fat. Uh, the issue is saturated fats are actually uh, not good fats. Um, saturated fats do not have so the saturated fats do not have double do not have double bonds and mostly they are bad fats so we have tra we have trans fat trans fats have double bonds with the hydrogens across so they have what we call double bonds in trans configuration you can see one hydrogen is here the other hydrogen is here so double bonds with the hydrogens across um, opposite side of each other so that uh, trans fat has hydrogen has double bond with hydrogen across each other or on the opposite side of each other then we have cis fat this is cis fat cis fat the hydrogens are on the same side hydrogen uh, has double bond with hydrogen on the same side so uh, you, you can see that there is really no big difference between cis fat or between trans fat and cis fat <laughs> they both look like straight line fats so this one is not very different from this one so whatever problems the saturated fat is going to have the cis fat is also uh, the trans fat is also going to have so whatever problems that uh, the saturated fat is going to have the trans ha the trans fat is also going to have because the trans fat looks like a straight line like this one cis fat in the uh, cis fat is different cis fat looks bent so it will not have the problems of these two below. So cis fat, you see, it looks like this. It will not behave as saturated fat because it is bent. The places it goes are, are different from the places that the saturated fat or the trans fat can go. Cis fat is easily digested in the body so we can digest uh, since cis fat without problem up to now we don't know about digestion of trans fat so we don't know about digestion of trans fat 
So the assumption is that it cannot be digested. But people are, are still doing research to find out if we can digest trans fat. That's why we say trans fat is bad because we don't know in the body what can digest trans fat. That's why companies they make sure to minimize the amount of trans fat in their cooking oil and something because they know once it gets into the body you cannot remove it from the body because you cannot digest it which is bad so that's the bad thing about trans fat however take note because your teacher can give you diagrams of this so that you are able to recognize which one is trans fat which one is saturated and which one is a cis fat so how do you recognize the these three types of fats uh the trans fat this the saturated fat will have no double bond so the saturated fat will have no double bond so this is a saturated fat no double bond the trans fat will have double bond but the hydrogens will be on opposite sides the cis fat will have double bond but you see how it has bent and the hydrogens will be on the same side that will tell you that this is a cis fa fat when the hydrogens are on the same side cis fat is the only one is the is a good one because we can digest it this one the trans fat cannot digest so we don't want to eat it so um these are some of the uh the uh, lipids um that you can uh, deal with and um this is normal lipid there is no p here so this is normal lipid if you are given a diagram the same thing this is also a normal fatty acid the same this is a normal fatty acid but then if you look at this uh, if you look at this this one is a phospholipid on it because of this phosphorus phosphate here this one is phospholipid oh all these are actually phospholipids let me just um I, I I didn't see the, the the phosphate. All these we see here are phospholipids. You can see the phosphate here. This part makes it a phospholipid. This part makes it a phospholipid. This part makes it a phospholipid. Here, this part, the P, where you see the P, you have a phospholipid. Normal lipid, you don't have a P. So these ones are steroids. So this is uh, how the steroids will look, will look like. You can be given a diagram. This is a diagram. What is this? This diagram shows a steroid. So take note of the diagram of steroid, diagram of phospholipid, and diagram of a, a normal fatty acid then we talk about proteins general characteristics so proteins have amino acid as a monomer so amino acid is a monomer of protein
So how do amino acids look like? Amino acids have like a carbon in the middle here on one side they have this one on, on on the other side they have or or we can say they ha we have a central carbon here one side we have this one is known as uh the amine group or amino group and this one is an, the, an acid group. And because of that, when we add this and this, we call it amino acid. Because it has an amino group and an acid, an acid group. So this group here is known as an amine, an amino group or um, an amino group from the amino acid. And I'll show you uh, a proper diagram of this amino acid as we move along. So that's what we are saying here. This is the amino group. This is carb the carboxylic acid group. There are 20 different important or essential amino acids. Um, and we'll see what R means in the amino acids. Every other thing is the same, but what var what varies is what changes on the amino acid is the R. So you have something like this. NH3 or NH2, the amino group. We have carbon here and we have the carboxylic acid. And then we have hydrogen here and we have something here we call R. So R can be anything. It can be like CH3. It can be hydrogen. It can be CH3, CH2, CH3, or CH2, CH2, CH3. So this one is going to change. But here, this part will remain the same for every amino acid. So th this is what you are, you are saying. This is the R part. This is the amino group. <coughs> this is the acid group, the COOH group. <coughs> this hydrogen is always there. What changes is this part. As this part changes, the name of the amino acid also changes. So this one is an amino acid. So it has the amino group, the carboxylic acid group, and the C in the middle with H and then R. So when you add several amino acids, you make proteins. And proteins have a, a lot of functions in the body. They serve as structural, structural proteins. <coughs> like the ones that we use for muscles as structural proteins. Then we have enzymes that speed up chemical reactions. We have a lot of proteins that work as enzymes. And I think about things like hemoglobin and, and, and uh, not hemoglobin and such, but think about um, what examples of proteins do we uh, use as enzymes? Things that are in the saliva, things that are in the stomach, most of them are proteins. And they serve as transport carriers. So like hemoglobin. Hemoglobin carries oxygen in the blood that is protein so it's serve as 
carriers. They act as an antibiotics and allow materials to cross cell membranes. So really protein has a lot of functions. Muscles act as enzymes in like salivary am amylose, things like those. They act as enzymes. They serve as transport carriers. They act as anti anti antibodies and they allow materials to cross cell membrane. So please take note of these uh, functions of proteins. So when we say that protein comes from uh, amino acid, here we have two, we have uh, different amino acids. You can see that uh, this part is the same for all the amino acid. This part is the arrow we are talking about. This is the part that changes. You can see this one is the same. You can find it, find it here, you can find it here, but this is R2. Right. You see the, um, the amino group, the amino acid group is the same here. This is R3. That's what changes. <coughs> and we have different names for each amino acid. You don't need to remember the names, but just know that the amino acid has this part here, and this is the part that changes. And also be able to recognize, if someone shows you, be able to recognize that this is amino acid. So these are just the representative of the amino acid. Now when you combine two amino acids, or when you combine amino acids, you form, you combine them through a peptide bond. So how does a peptide bond form? Let me see if we will we'll see it. You see, a, a peptide will have two amino acids here. Amino acid 1, amino acid 2. A peptide forms through dehydration again. So a peptide bond forms through dehydration if someone asks you what how does a peptide bond form a peptide bond forms through dehydration here we have the acid group and the amino group what happens the amino group loses one hydrogen the acid group loses OH so this and this are going to combine to form water and they will create a place for this and this to combine to form a chemical bond so and uh, a peptide bond is between nitrogen and carbon so a peptide bond is always between nitrogen and carbon forming a double bond so a peptide bond is between nitrogen which is N and carbon carbon with and the, the carbon The carbon bonded to oxygen. So a peptide bond will form between nitrogen, which is this one, and the carbon, this carbon bonded to oxygen. That's where the peptide bond will be. So, um, a peptide bond is a polar co covalent. Why is it polar covalent? Because nitrogen and carbon, they'll, 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 they'll have a polarity. Nitrogen is more negative than 
carbon. So carbon here will be positive, the nitrogen side will be negative. And then because of that, we create polarity between the two. So that's about peptide bond. If you want to break peptide bond, so we break peptide bond through hydrolysis. That's what we are seeing. Going this way is hydrolysis. Going this way is dehydration. Now, how are proteins organized? We have three levels of organization for protein. The first level is primary. So primary is just straight chain organization. So you just have peptides linking in a straight chain. That's what it means. So primary organization is peptides linking in a straight chain. So it will just be like, this is the primary organization. Then we have secondary organization. So I can get rid of this so that I write something there. So secondary organization of protein is coiling so the primary uh, the primary chain coils so it will be like this this is secondary organization you see so the primary ring, ring the primary chain coils because of hydrogen bonding primary chain coils because of hydrogen bonding. So that is secondary, secondary structure. Primary, we said, primary is just a straight line like this. This is the primary. While this one is secondary structure coiling what about the tertiary structure now tertiary structure is like more coiling so tertiary structure is more coiling of the secondary structure of the secondary structure. So we say the secondary structure will coil like this. Tertiary structure will coil like this. So the coiling within coiling. So that one is tertiary structure coiling within coiling that's what it means so if someone asks you what is tertiary structure so you just say it is coiling within coiling of protein or it is more coiling of the second secondary structure. That is tertiary structure. 
here we already talked about the peptide so um really when you talk about the level of proteins the fun the the, the the coiling of the protein the proteins will determine what its function is that's what happens the the, the level of coiling of protein will determine uh, the function of the protein like most enzymes have this structure some some proteins have one part that is primary another part that is secondary structure another part that is tertiary structure so you can have one protein that is moving like this and then it starts coiling here and then do more coiling towards the end so the same protein having different structure like this is first level first level this is second level this is third level mm, this third level is gone so this is third level but there are some proteins that have a fourth level we call it quaternary structure so in this fourth level we have more than one protein so here fourth level we have two or more proteins coiling together that is known as a quaternary structure so this is the fourth level so we have we have primary level we have secondary level we have tertiary level and we have quaternary level that's the fourth level now look at this this definition here what does what does it mean when we say denatured 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 is changing the structure of protein through heat or adding acid so if you want to denature is is like damaging the protein or changing the structure of the protein through heating the protein or adding acid to protein that's what denatured means that's why the body must maintain a specific acid to avoid denaturing proteins so you need to write down that so uh the human body maintains specific acidity specific acidity to avoid denaturing proteins in the body because if the proteins in the body are denatured <laughs> then we are doomed so take note of this definition your teacher can ask about this definition denatured
I think I'll stop here and do probably the last video for this part.